Hello. We're going to start the quantum and nuclear physics AHL additional higher level topic with a look at the photoelectric effect. So the photoelectric effect is the, the first uh, section that we're going to look at, um, uh, the first subsection of the interaction of matter with radiation section, uh, looking at the concept of photons and the photoelectric effect. A couple of equations we'll be using there. So the story of photons and the photoelectric effect really goes back to the late 19th century. Um, because around that time, uh, scientists, engineers, this was, was the, uh, the birth of uh, electric lighting, for example, were able to look at the spectrum of hot objects and see how the intensity of their emissions varied with wavelength when you change the temperature of the emitter, um, the idea of black body radiation that, that we've come across before. The trouble was, although they could measure this and see what it was like, they didn't actually have a theory that was able to predict it. Uh, the most common theory at the time was something called the, the Raleigh Jeans uh, law, and it's shown on the sort of dashed line in this diagram. And as you can see, it really it didn't work. It just didn't match the available data. Um, in the early 20th century, I think it was Aaron Frest who referred to this as the, the ultraviolet catastrophe, particularly because it was bad at all wavelengths, but it was particularly bad at the ultraviolet. But a solution actually already existed. A guy called Max Planck, uh, writing in 1900, had proposed a relationship, which is the equation that describes that curve for different wavelengths and, and different temperatures. Yet it had been, well, not rejected, it certainly wasn't totally accepted that it was widely not accepted um, because he had made some assumptions when generating this information one of which was this idea of, of quantizing energy so the idea that the energy emitted in the form of electromagnetic radiation came in little packets irreducible steps and as part of his equation you can kind of make it out there um, it, this was equations more in terms of wavelength because that's how uh, the black body spectrum is generally described but in terms of the frequency an element of his equation was this idea of e equals hf so the idea that you have little packets of light packets of energy whose energy depends on the frequency of the light with a constant of proportionality being h Planck's constant these little packets we nowadays call photons but at the time as I say there wasn't there wasn't the the experimental evidence to support them that changed a few years later to illustrate that and to demonstrate it and, and you can you can find some sort of videos of this in action um, it's helpful to imagine a device called a gold leaf electroscope now the gold leaf electroscope is a was a device invented over 100 years ago now um, and then again you may have encountered it before but fundamentally um, the idea is that it can be used to demonstrate charge uh, because uh, you can charge up the disc um, and that can uh, distribute the charge to the metal plate and also to the gold leaf now gold leaf literally is, is gold hammered very thin as famously used um, in the um, in the, the the Rutherford Geiger Marsden experiment. Um, and you can have this thing charged with electrons. So electrons are distributed through the surface since they're on the gold leaf, which is very, very light, and on the metal plate, uh, they exert a, a repulsive force. And it takes you well. And you just leave there and away. Yeah, very slowly the charge will, will leak away, but generally it'll just sit there. And we can demonstrate and late 19th century early 20th century physicists did similar experiments they didn't, didn't have lasers but they could demonstrate that 
if you shone light red light on on this electroscope this charged electroscope nothing would happen it didn't matter if it was low level red light or if it was really bright intense red light nothing would happen but if you increased the frequency shortened the wavelength of the light that you were using then once you got above a certain value higher than a certain frequency then the leaf would fall down because the electrons that were being liberated from the from the surface of the metal the exact frequency would depend on the metal we call that the threshold frequency but once you put above, got above that threshold frequency then the the electrons would start to be discharged even in low level light more quickly if you use more intense light but any any light frequency above the threshold frequency those electrons would start to be emitted and this was weird classical physics would say that yeah if you want to knock electrons off you just have to pump energy in and the, the wavelength the frequency was irrelevant and not only that you know the 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 intensity of the light would have a huge effect whereas the wavelength wouldn't have any effect and this could not be explained until 1905 our man albert einstein provided an explanation this work actually got him the nobel prize in in 1921 for his explanation of the photoelectric effect okay so these are the key points when the leaf falls only the frequency affects the emission above that threshold frequency the illumination intensity does not determine if there will be electron emission if there is electron emission it, it, it will affect the rate of it but it will not determine if there's electron emission so what was einstein's solution well he went to Planck's idea of the quantized energy the photon as we would call it with E equals HF and he said you take your photons and each photon each photon only interacts with one electron so this was not like the classical physics where light is a wave and it would spread out as a wave and as that wave impacted on the surface it would be distributed amongst the photons nope amongst the electrons no it's photons and each photon goes with one electron and yes there's this threshold frequency and the reason is this threshold frequency is because a certain amount of work in its physics sense a certain amount of energy needs to be done to liberate the photon that amount of energy he called the work function so the photon has energy it gives it to an electron if the photon has more energy than the work function the electron is liberated if it doesn't if a photon does not have more energy than the work function nothing happens the plate gets a bit warmer but that's bad it jiggles around but only above the threshold frequency e equals hf so only above a certain frequency is above a certain energy and only if that energy is above the work function then the electron is liberated and if there is excess if the photon carries more energy than the work function then whatever the extra energy is that's carried so to speak or given or exhibited by the emitted electron the photoelectron as kinetic energy so it will leave faster or have greater velocity and increasing the intensity of light increases the number of photons so very intense low frequency light will produce lots and lots of low energy photons but since only one photon interacts with one electron it doesn't matter doesn't matter how many you have if the energy is not enough 
you're not going to have any photoelectrons. If the energy is enough, then sure. Increasing the intensity increases the number of photons, increases the number of photons that can interact with electrons and liberate more electrons. Which it does instantaneously. You can do the very moment that um, photons impact electrons, then uh, they are liberated. There was a, a recent paper, uh, which uh, I'll try and find the link, which um, uh, found the amount of time required to do this, and it's, it's incredibly small time. So the equation that you'll see in the data booklet for this is E max equals HF minus phi, and every term of this is really just an energy argument. So E max is the kinetic energy of the emitted photoelectron, if there is one. HF is the energy of the incident photon. And phi is the work function. So in order for there to be a, any value of E max, any real or positive value of E max, then HF has to be bigger than phi. The photon incident energy has to be bigger than the work function. And the photon incident energy is quoted in terms of the frequency of the light, HF. So plus, uh, the, the picture at the bottom there illustrates different frequencies of light impacting on sodium. So sodium has a work function in um, electron volts, which is the common unit of energy rather than joules. You're never wrong to use joules, but electron volts is common in atomic physics. So 630 nanometer light, the red light, has an energy of 1.97 electron volts. No electron emissions, because that's less than the work function. Once you get to 440 nanometers, which is 2.82 electron volts, that's bigger than 2.75 electron volts, so you do get photon emission, and that gives you a certain amount of kinetic energy. Um, 82 minus 75 is 0 0.07 electron volts worth of kinetic energy will kick out your electrons with a velocity of about 1.6 times 10 to the 5 meters squared. Half mv squared, you can use half mv squared as long as your not, electrons are not going too fast because you don't have to get relativistic. Uh, purple light, 390 nanometers, 3.180 electron volts. That's a bigger excess energy, that's a bigger Emax, therefore that's a bigger velocity. It's a pretty simple equation, really. However, Einstein was a theoretician. Yes, he was explaining a practical demonstration. But he wasn't really investigating it experimentally himself. And there was a man called uh, Robert Millikan. Millikan was was famous, um, famous experimentalist. He he had demonstrated the uh, the charge on an electron just a few years earlier. Um, and he was again also to win the Nobel Prize. He won the Nobel Prize in 1923 for his work on the charge on electron and on this. And he didn't actually believe Einstein. He set out to try and disprove Einstein. He later found that his experiment really just supported Einstein. So what he had was he had a, a, a plate, the emitter, and a light shining on it so photoelectrons would go off. But what he also did was he put this into a vacuum and had another plate that would collect the electrons and connect it to a circuit and he would put a very very sensitive uh, animator or galvanometer in there so he could measure the current and also a power supply so with the power supply not turned on and of light of enough uh, of appropriate wavelength frequency you would get a very small current and what would happen is you'd say okay i've got this current and then he would change the power supply hooked up the other way around so it was it was repelling the electrons as they approached slowing them down and once he got to a certain potential difference the current would go to zero just just at that point where it goes to zero because he realized that that potential difference was the exact potential difference required to stop the electrons which would give him the energy of the electrons so he could directly measure the energy of these electrons from if you remember this from you know, topic five electric currents the equation is the electric field strength um, e max so the energy given is the charge multiplied by the potential difference e the s 
take Einstein's equation, E max equals HF minus 5, replace E max with EVS, so E stopping potential, VS is the stopping potential, okay, equals HF minus HF0. So phi is the uh, work function, but it's that's the amount of energy that's exactly equivalent, if you remember, to a photon at that threshold frequency. So a photon of a threshold frequency has a has exactly the work function amount of energy so we can replace phi with hf0 we want to deal with wavelengths because that's what we normally deal with you could leave this as frequency but we'll, we'll, we'll change it to wavelength so it's uh, so replace f with c over lambda and you can see that in the equation there and then divide through by the charge on the electron e so you get that the stopping potential equals two terms hc over e lambda minus hc over e lambda zero but Note that on those on the right hand side of the equation there, h is a constant, Planck's constant, c is the speed of light, which is a constant, lambda zero is the threshold frequency, which is a constant for for a given um, metal, and e the charge of an electron, which is a constant. The only variables you've got, if you wanted to 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 plot some variables, are the stopping potential and the wavelength. If you change the wavelength of the light, you will change the stopping potential. Okay, the shorter the wavelength, going to be the greater the stopping potential, the blue of the light. And you can plot a graph, because this is y equals mx plus c. So y is vs, and your x is 1 over lambda, which is your, your variable. Then you're going to have your gradient being hc over e. Your x-intercept is the 1 over the, the, the threshold wavelength, the threshold frequency so to speak and c is going to be um, minus it's going to be down there hc over e lambda zero now the reason millikan did this up well, one of the things that he came out of this was this actually enabled him to get a value for h okay because he knew the speed of light he knew the charge of an electron he'd worked it out himself so the only thing left there from that gradient is Planck's constant so he was able to experimentally determine Planck's constant which is an impressive impressive thing, thing to do just to repeat one final thing this is evidence for particle theory this is evidence that light is a particle okay it relies on these photons to work it relies on the photons because the wave theory wouldn't have a threshold frequency it would just worry about the intensity Except the, the one possible exception to that is, okay, well, maybe you need a certain intensity, maybe you need a certain energy level, okay? But even low intensity light could provide energy if it built up, if there was a time delay between uh, the light being shone on the surface and it emitted, and we don't see that, as I say. We always see an instantaneous discharge, an instantaneous emission of photoelectrons. So that says that, that light is a particle. However, all of topic four, all of topic nine have said that light is a wave. Interference, diffraction, these are all wave phenomena show that light is a wave. Here, the photoelectric effect shows that light is a particle. Which is it? Well, both and neither. Instead, we have the very quantum physics concept of wave particle duality. Light, electromagnetic radiation, yes, it's a wave, sometimes, but it's also kind of a particle. It's kind of both. Okay, so we've looked at photons, looked at the photoelectric effect, we've discussed the photoelectric effect experiment and explained which features of it cannot be explained by classical wave theory, and we've solved problems both graphically and algebraically to do with the photoelectric effect. Thank you very much.